Wraith is the most powerful car Rolls-Royce has ever made, and perhaps the closest thing to a sports car we've ever seen from the brand. Based on the Mark's Ghost entry-level saloon, there's nothing else quite like this British-made luxury Grand Touring Coupe, nor should there be for the exalted asking price. It's a reassuring sign that this classic company is in good hands. This is without doubt the fastest, the most powerful and the most dynamic machine Rolls-Royce has ever made. But that doesn't make it a sports car. Instead, the company describes this fastback coupe as a Super GT. 2.3 tons and 5.3 meters of pulse quickening grand touring performance you could never anticipate merely from taking a seat on the sumptuous leather chairs that position you lower than you would be in a ghost or a phantom but still offer a commanding view across that famous bonnet beneath it beats a mighty 6.6 .6 litre V12 engine with quite enough power and torque, 642 brake horsepower and 800 newton metres to firmly worry the upstarts down the road at Bentley. You're aware within 50 yards that this is something very special. There's no unseemly launch control system, but even so, 62 miles an hour comes and goes almost supercar style in just over four seconds before the 100 mile an hour mark is passed barely six seconds later. Speed of this sort is usually accompanied by a suitable sousson of drama, but here things are a little different. I don't think I've ever driven a car this fast, this easily. There may be as much power beneath the bonnet as you'd find in a McLaren F1 and outside the horizon may be hurling itself towards you as if on fast forward, but from within the story is merely one of poise and measured ease. Perhaps it's the smooth throttle mapping or maybe the refinement of the suspension, the lack of wind noise, the well-oiled feel to the steering or the feeling that instead of being powered by an engine, you're being propelled from behind by the benevolence of some giant hand. Whatever the truth, the experience is majestic. That engine, like this car's platform, is sourced from BMW. Do those things make it any less of a Rolls-Royce? I think not. What makes this wraith worthy of its spirit of ecstasy bonnet mascot, sculptor Charles Sykes's tribute to his mistress, Eleanor Thornton, is the exquisite detail that underpins everything about it. Even that mascot is aerodynamic, canted back a few degrees more than it would be in the saloon model to give the impression of speed. I'm not sure though that the substantial shape works from all angles. The profile is certainly purposeful with larger 20 inch wheels than you'd find on a Ghost working well with the high waistline. From a rear three-quarter view, though, you really sense the stylistic weight of enormous C-pillars that flow into an expensively brazed panel, there to blend beautifully with the optional two-tone paint finish. Entry, as usual with a modern Rolls-Royce, is via this vault-like coach door, unusual in the way it aids access by hinging at the back rather than at the front. Once you take your place inside, you'll find yourself assuming a driving position that's a little less dynamic than you might expect from such a supposedly sporty car. The seat a little high and upright. It's certainly very easy to get comfortable with an all-pervading feel of luxury that you touch, feel, smell and enjoy all over again every time you take the wheel. The buttery soft leather is exquisite, and I also love this Canadel panelling made of Brazilian rosewood that reminds me more of something you'd berth in the marina at Antibes. I was talking earlier about the design of the coach doors, the benefit of which you'll really start to appreciate when it comes to taking a seat in the rear, for the lack of B-pillar impediment makes access easy. Once you're ensconced, 
there's a decent amount of legroom, although if you're close to six foot, headroom might be at a little more of a premium. Back in 1930, Rolls-Royce's founding managing director, Claude Johnson, wrote that the serpent of speed and power has entered this company and is likely to poison its existence. Perhaps it did in his pre-war years, but they were times when a car bearing the spirit of ecstasy was required to conform to the measured expectations of the aristocracy. Today, the appeal of the brand must be wider and more dynamic, reflective of the hopes and aspirations of a new, moneyed and more demanding generation. It must deliver more models like this, a car for the curious, the confident and the bold but a car that is still, in every way, a Rolls-Royce and an exquisite pleasure.